Dr. Chris Smith, virologist, founder of the Naked Scientist podcast, and Sir Walter Distinguished Adjunct Professor at Murdoch University. Thanks for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, Chris, the world is in the midst of a pandemic right now. Can you just explain what novel coronavirus is and the seriousness of the health risk? Okay, this new virus emerged, we think, sometime in November. And that's based on various measures taking samples from Wuhan City in China, where it appeared from. It's a member of the coronavirus family. This is a pretty big family of viruses. And there's one particular subfamily called the beta coronaviruses. And this is a member of those. And it's very closely related, about 80% similar to the SARS virus that first emerged in 2002 uh, to 2003, also under very similar circumstances from China. And it's about 96.5% similar to a bat coronavirus. So our current theory is that this is a virus that's come from bats. It's possibly mixed in with a bit of another animal called a pangolin, which has endowed it with some additional activity and it's then jumped into people and it's pretty infectious it circulates really fast and really well which is why it's now spreading so vigorously and how serious should we be taking this well initially when it happened i don't think anyone did take it that seriously and i thought i think they regarded it largely as a problem confined to china and then when it began to spread farther afield people began to take notice and then when it arrived in europe and indeed, Europe has now been defined as the epicenter of this, especially Italy in Europe, but subsequently other countries now following like a domino effect. I think people are taking it really very seriously. And it's not just because it's going to be a threat to people's health. It's a big threat to the world's wallet because the economic impacts and the economic fallout of this is going to be very serious and go on for a very long time. So looking at the health side of things, how is it transferred? And, and I guess what can everyone do to protect themselves? This is a respiratory infection. And what that means is that when you cough or sneeze, small droplets are expelled from the nose and the mouth. And in those droplets, if you've got this coronavirus, there will be thousands to millions of virus particles. These are very tiny. The virus itself is only about 100 nanometers across. So that's about one ten thousandth of a millimeter in diameter. So if you think in your mind about the ruler you used at school in the classroom and you think about the first millimeter of that ruler, you could line up 10,000 of these virus particles side by side in just that first millimeter. With a size that tiny, these things, when they get into the air, just bob around like dust in the air. So they're airborne. And if you walk into an environment where someone has been coughing and spluttering and expelling these virus particles, you can breathe them in. And the infectious dose appears to be pretty low. You only need to be exposed to in the region of 10 or 20 of these particles to near enough guarantee that you're going to pick this up. The virus being a virus absolutely needs to engage with our cells and then hijack them and turn them into virus factories. So we think that that happens chiefly in the respiratory tract, although people are still working on whether other parts of the body, for instance, the GI tract might also be able to be susceptible to infection. The virus invades cells that line the respiratory tract. It has a particular tropism or preponderance to infect lung tissue. And once it gets into the cells, it, it basically turns them into virus factories. And each infected cell then churns out thousands of new virus particles. These then go on to infect adjacent surrounding cells. And some also are then breathed out as well. So they can go on to infect adjacent surrounding people. In terms of overcoming that, we're hearing a lot about social distancing. Can you explain what this is and why it's effective? Well, this is an acute viral infection. What that means is that when you have this virus, you're ill, but you're also infectious. But then when you recover, and that takes a week or two, you're then immune because your immune system produces antibodies and white blood cells that can fight this thing off. And then it renders you uninfectable, at least in the near term probably in the long term afterwards. So that means this virus is always looking for its next host because in order to sustain a chain of transmission, it has to continue to spread and it's got to do it quite quickly. So by making it more difficult for the virus to do that, because it doesn't have this particular human virus, doesn't have a natural animal reservoir or anywhere it can go in the environment apart from continuously leap from person to person, if we make it harder for it to jump from person to person, we'll at least slow down and possibly even stop the transmission. And so that's the goal of the, the current mechanisms and strategies that have been put forward by a range of agencies to try to stop this. And how about those who have been asked to self-isolate? What does this mean? Can they see anyone? Can they go outside? 
Well, first of all, why are we asking some people to self-isolate? This is informed by the observation from large numbers of people now that this is not an equal opportunities virus. It's a particularly ageist virus because although it can infect everybody, it's particularly nasty and hostile to older people and particularly older people that have other coexisting health problems. So for example, if you are in your 70s, your risk of having severe complications with this virus are significantly higher, especially in the 70s and 80s, than in someone who's in, for instance, their noughties. If they're a young child, they may have no symptoms whatsoever. So for that reason, given that the risk is, is asymmetrical and skewed towards people who are older, the aim is to try to protect older people by urging them to stay away from areas where they might contract the virus. And in that way, even if younger people catch it and become immune, the older people will eventually be protected by the herd immunity that grows in the population as healthier people who are at less risk slowly become immune to it. Okay, and how about the world around us? How long does the virus live on surfaces? This is an outstanding question, but the initial data suggests that it probably bobs around in the air for a matter of hours before the particles dry up and are no longer infectious. If it comes down out of the air and lands on a surface, estimates range from hours to minutes through to about three days. And it also depends on what sort of surface it lands on. Certain surfaces, for instance, materials and plastics, and if the environment is not particularly hostile, so it's not bright sunlight, it's not hot, dry air, it may persist there in an infectious state for three days, 72 hours or so. On other surfaces, the lifetime is much less. On surfaces made of, for instance, copper, this appears to be toxic. And that's why people are talking about perhaps coating door handles in hospitals with reactive metals like copper, possibly also silver. And this may help to deactivate the virus. On your hands, probably similar in the sense that it's gonna lurk there for minutes to hours. But since we touch our faces up to 20 times an hour, that's still a risk. So the guidance being given to people, if you can't stay away from people who are coughing and spluttering, at the very least, be diligent about washing your hands because then if you have touched a surface that's got the virus on it and someone pointed out to me yesterday just think about when you press the button when crossing the road that those buttons have been touched by many many people you could pick up virus that way wash your hands running water soap about 20 seconds and this will help to minimize your risk of at least transferring the virus to your eyes or your nose or your mouth. And in terms of assessing our own health is it possible to have novel coronavirus with no symptoms at all? Well, we don't know. And the evidence is that children get very trivial infections compared to adults. And it may well be that some children have almost no symptoms whatsoever. The jury's out about why this is happening. There are some interesting theories, and it may relate to the fact that as we get older, our immune system changes and the way our immune system works changes. Also, we become more experienced with having caught other viruses, including related coronaviruses that circulate naturally in humans, but by catching those first, that might endow us with other kinds of antibodies and immune responses that then when we catch this new one, we get a more severe disease. We just don't know at the moment, but people are certainly watching children because they do appear to be very underrepresented in the statistics. It's very hard to believe they're not being infected. So our interpretation is more likely they are just being infected, but not developing overt symptoms. So we're not testing them. And as we think about identifying this virus, what are the symptoms that differ from the common flu and how do we tell one from the other? Really difficult. And the virus tends to present with a fever. Well, so do many viruses. And it also causes tiredness, fatigue, muscle aches and pains. So do many viruses and a dry cough. So do many viruses. And this has been the big challenge because unlike other viruses that produce very striking standout symptoms where making a clinical diagnosis, in other words, being able to just look at somebody and say, I think I know what the diagnosis is, that's really difficult with this. It's basically hiding in plain sight, which means sorting wheat from chaff. And especially with this range of symptoms from possibly no symptoms in children right through to more dramatic disease in older people, it's been really difficult to, to easily advise people if you have this symptom, do the following. Because at the moment we're saying to people, if you have these symptoms, you should isolate yourself for up to 14 days. So you can imagine the fallout from this because entire families are having to now take themselves out of, out of circulation and out of work for up to two weeks and they don't even know if they've got the disease or not. Now, can we expect the virus to return each year like the flu and become a normal part of life? 
at the moment, we're still modeling what's going to happen. And this is going to determine or be determined to a certain extent by how we manage this. Now, if we come up with a vaccine in the near future, then that would obviously stamp out the virus, at least in the near term. At the moment, though, my instinct tells me that because this is a really infectious virus, it spreads very efficiently amongst people. Probably it will enter the realm of the coronavirus family that circulates in humans. There are four common coronaviruses that infect humans every winter and they just go around the globe causing pretty trivial symptoms. I strongly suspect that this one will join that family and it will continue to circulate producing small numbers of infections in probably mainly younger people year on year on year but because those young people will catch it when they are young they'll probably have very trivial symptoms and then they'll have immunity even if it's partial immunity for the rest of their life. So we won't see this dramatic effect in older people if it does become a naturally circulating infection. Now, what should I do if I feel sick? Well, it depends what's wrong with you. And if you have the case definition, and the way we're defining this is, have you got a brand new onset, greater than 37.8 degree fever? So abrupt onset of a new fever is one of the characteristics. Also, an abrupt onset of a new cough. And this is not just a tickle in the throat that, you know, get up in the morning, feel a bit ropey, cough a bit, and then you're fine. This is a persistent tickly cough that doesn't relent and doesn't remit. And so if you have those symptoms, it's possible that you could have this. And at the moment, some countries are testing people if they have those symptoms. Some countries are saying on clinical grounds, isolate yourself, isolate yourself for at least the time that you're symptomatic. And if you live with other people, because there is the potential for a transmission chain, in other words, handing it from one person to the next, because of that, if you've got a family unit or a household unit like that, you should isolate yourself for 14 days because the incubation period for this is about five days. So if you are assumed to be infectious from the end of that incubation period, the other people who you live with are gonna, gonna get it about five days after that. So if you take yourselves out of circulation for about 14 or 15 days, that should complete the cycle and then everyone should be immune and better. Now you mentioned there's no treatment for novel coronavirus yet. How long does it normally take to develop a treatment for this sort of thing? Well, I would put it to you that um, we've known about uh, many viruses, including the common cold, for many years, and flu pandemics were defined and documented by the ancient Greeks thousands of years ago. There are very few drugs that are actually in use for treating these things. So I'd say that uh, how long is a piece of string? certain viruses have lent themselves to being more amenable to us finding drugs to deal with them. HIV is a really good example. We've got a very big repertoire of drugs now that we can combat things like HIV with. Hepatitis C, we've now been able to find ways to turn what was an incurable disease into a curable disease. The coronaviruses hitherto have been a fairly rare group, a fairly low grade group of pathogens for people. So they really haven't received the kind of attention that other viruses like HIV have. So as a result, the amount of research into antiviral drugs has been relatively low. Ditto vaccines. Now that did change a few years ago because other viruses that are related to this new coronavirus did emerge. There was SARS, of course, but then there's another one, which is a relative called MERS-CoV. And because that has continued to circulate in the Middle East and, and does have a very high case fatality rate of about one person in three, people have been actively exploring vaccines for that. And so we've got a bit of a head start with this new virus when it comes to vaccines, because people are using some of that learning from our other encounters with these and related viruses to inform what's, what approach they're going to take. But it is early days. And in the event that that vaccine isn't developed in the foreseeable future, how does this virus sort of embed itself in, in everyday society? And how do we deal with that? Well, at the moment, what people are doing is trying to stop it by basically telling everyone to go home, shutting the workplace. There are universities all over the world that are closing their doors. Cambridge University among them, Harvard University was one of the first to do this. They're shutting research laboratories, including ironically, and I would say, and you know, contradictorily, laboratories that are working on these coronaviruses and possible drugs. I was talking to a group in one university department that are actually trying to find chemicals to block this and they're gonna to have to go home on Friday. So uh, in some respects, I hope we're not shooting ourselves in the foot, but this is the idea. Send people home, make only the most essential journeys that you have. Don't go to mass gatherings. Try to reduce your encounters with other people because although we don't 
try and kid ourselves that we can make this thing go away, what we can do is possibly slow down its penetration through the population. And the rationale for doing that is if we slow down the rate at which it spreads, then it doesn't reach such a peak so soon. And if you don't reach a peak of infection so soon, it's lower likelihood that in that peak will be people who become extremely unwell and therefore need the help of healthcare services. So we can effectively keep the peak below the threshold at which we max out our ability to deliver healthcare. That's the aspiration. It's probably an ambitious aim and we're, we're being pretty, pretty realistic about the fact there are going to be very large numbers of cases around the world and they almost certainly will outstrip the ability of the healthcare services in the majority of countries to cope. Any final words of advice for our medical community to get through this? Well, I think keep a, a sense of, of um, proportion here because remember that 99% of people who catch this are going to recover completely uneventfully. More than 80% of people will have very trivial symptoms indeed. The about 20%, one in five people who don't have trivial symptoms will nonetheless still go on to recover. Only about a fifth of that fifth of the people who catch this. So a very small number, single numbers of percent are gonna have really severe problems. And those people are largely gonna be people who have pre-existing health problems. So if you're in that group, take steps to protect yourself to the best extent that you can. And let's all hope that we can come up with a vaccine that will protect that particular group of people before too long. We're looking probably at 12 to 18 months though. Terrific, Dr. Chris Smith, thanks so much for your time. Pleasure.